As we learn more and more about the nuances of regional and local climates and their impact on our buildings and building materials, we can be left wondering what types of wall assemblies will actually work for our climate without causing problems like condensation or mold or premature degradation. Especially as we're pushed to insulate more and improve energy efficiency, the buildup of our walls is really starting to change, and unless you're constructing some variation of the perfect wall, there really isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, especially when you take into account how different parts of the country and the world build, well, differently. In this video, we're going to be walking through wall assemblies that work for IECC climate zones 1, 2, and 3, which are considered to be warm climates, taking into account common building practices, as well as discussing some of the limitations that we face when building in these climates. Let's get into it. Now for starters, I want to preface this by saying that all of these wall assemblies are based on standard residential construction in the United States, so mostly light wood framed buildings, although we do have some variations with CMU that we'll be talking about, but we're not going to be talking about any alternative wall systems like SIPs or ICFs or straw bale buildings, but the fact is that light wood framing is used for the vast majority of residential construction, and therefore that's what we're going to be focusing on since this is what most of us are familiar with. Now make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already because we're going to be doing several more of these types of videos for temperate climates and cold climates as well as for roof assemblies so lots of stuff in store that you won't want to miss. So climate zones 1, 2, and 3 are considered warm climate zones as they are cooling dominated climates where air conditioning is running for much of the year and warm climates can be broken up into warm, dry, and warm humid. It's easy to build something that works in a warm and dry climate since there's a lot of forgiveness when it comes to moisture. This is the opposite in hot, humid climates where we have an enormous amount of inward vapor drive that can cause condensation and mold to form on the backside of our interior finishes if we're not careful. So let's talk about wall assembly number one. This would work for hot, humid climates as well as hot and dry climates. First off, we have our framed wall assembly. This is a standard 2x6 wall that's sheathed with either OSB, plywood, or gypsum sheathing. On the interior side of the wall, we have our standard gypsum board, though if you're building in an especially humid climate and you have concerns about mold growth, you could just opt for a fiberglass matte face gypsum product like Dens Armor Plus to eliminate the food source, but if you design and construct this wall correctly, you don't need it. Then, installed on the surface of the sheathing, we have a semi-vapor permeable, self-adhered, fluid applied, or integrated weather resistive barrier system. Integrated weather resistive barriers are basically a zip system or force field sheathing. This is serving as our water and air control air and our vapor control air in this assembly. In warm climates, the primary air barrier should be located on the outside in the form of the weather resistive barrier in order to prevent warm, humid air from leaking into the cavity and condensing on the backside of the drywall. Remember, we're air conditioning these spaces and warm air can carry a lot more moisture than cold air. That warm, moisture laden air will want to migrate into the cool and dry interior space, and so we want to stop it before it gets inside. Now we also mentioned that this is serving as a vapor control air in the assembly, not a vapor barrier, but something to slow down vapor diffusion into the wall. And that's why using a material that's semi-vapor permeable at around 10 perms will work just fine here. In the case of OSB sheathing, the OSB is actually a fairly effective vapor retarder in this type of application, and so you don't need to worry as much about the perm rating of the water and air control air. However, we do want to make sure that whatever insulation that we're using on the interior side of that wall is completely vapor open. The reason being is that we don't want to inhibit our wall from drying to the interior. Remember that vapor drive is predominantly from the outside inwards because moisture moves from warm to cold and from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. If we use foil-faced bat insulation or plastic vapor barriers on the interior side of that wall, we'll trap any moisture that gets inside the cavity. Moisture often takes the form of condensation from air leakage, but if you did happen to have a leak in that wall, it would have no ability to dry out, and that's where we see a ton of mold and rot in these climates. So for insulation materials, we can use any blown-in insulation or unfaced bat insulation, whether it's fiberglass, mineral wool, wood fiber, it doesn't really matter. Then for the exterior finish, stucco might be the most popular choice in these hot climates, and for good reason. Stucco can absorb a lot of that heat before it gets redistributed to the interior. However, when stucco is applied to wood framed wall assemblies, we have to have a drainage gap between the weather resistive barrier and the stucco layer. A lack of a drainage gap has resulted in many catastrophic moisture failures and rot remediations. The reason for that is that the stucco bonds to our synthetic building wraps and has a tendency to absorb and store a lot of water. Stucco is what we call a reservoir cladding due to its highly porous nature and its ability to soak up and redistribute water to other materials that are in direct contact. If the stucco is bonded to our weather resistive barrier, we get a complete loss of water repellent 
buoyancy due to capillary continuity and water makes its way inside. This is exacerbated when the sun hits the surface of that stucco because then it's rapidly driven to the interior both in the form of vapor and liquid water. Providing a drainage gap with some sort of drainage mesh or drainage membrane like a dimple mat will provide the benefits of a bond break, a capillary break, and drainage to get rid of that water and direct it away from the building. There are plenty of drainage mat products on the market. We have our own preferences, but make sure you're providing drainage between those surfaces. Then we finish off with our standard stucco rendering with expanded metal or fiberglass lath. One more thing to note, you don't want to install any vapor impermeable wallpaper like vinyl wallpaper or any impermeable paints like epoxy or oil-based paints on the gypsum board. You need the walls to be able to dry out back to the interior, and those finishes will stop or slow inward drying, and you'll likely see condensation on the back side of the drywall. Now if you wanted to take this wall assembly a step further, you can install exterior rigid insulation outboard of the weather resistive barrier to provide a thermal break between the hot outdoor conditions and the interior condition space. You don't need a lot of exterior insulation, all we're doing is trying to reduce the amount of conductive heat flow through the studs so that our air conditioning doesn't have to work so hard. One inch of rigid foam or mineral wool would be sufficient. Our next wall assembly that can be used successfully in hot, humid, or hot, dry climates features CMU or concrete masonry units. Now, there are a couple ways that we can design a CMU wall. We can either take the perfect wall approach in which all of the insulation is on the outside of the assembly, or we can insulate from the interior side of the CMU wall, either coating the CMUs in a stucco or installing a fluid applied membrane over the CMUs along with some sort of rain screen battens and siding. Generally speaking, if you're building in a region where hurricanes are common, like the Florida Keys, you're going to want to have the insulation on the inside of the CMU walls so that they don't get ripped away from the building. So let's talk about that first condition, the perfect wall approach. We have our CMU wall, which is considered to be a mass wall. A mass wall has a greater ability to store energy and keep the building cooler for a longer period of time since it takes more energy to raise the temperature of the block. Then applied over the exterior surface of the CMUs, we have a fluid applied water and air control layer that's compatible with the block. And this just prevents any water from being absorbed into the CMUs if it happens to leak behind the rigid insulation. And it prevents air leakage between any cracks or gaps in the blocks. The point being that we're trying to uncouple the exterior environment from the interior condition space. One of the biggest misconceptions is that CMU walls are inherently waterproof. The reality is that they're quite porous and will absorb and store water, not to mention that all of the mortar joints are areas of potential water intrusion, and the ungrouted cells of the CMU blocks can end up filling up with water, so it's really important not to skip the water control layer here. Then we have a rigid insulation installed over the waterproofed CMUs. This can be any rigid insulation of your choosing, whether it's EPS, XPS, GPS, polyiso, or rock wool. You do want to make sure that you're draining the surface between the block wall and the rigid insulation. There are a lot of ways to accomplish this drainage gap, but using a drainable insulation product with grooves or a drainable texture tends to be the easiest solution. As a general rule, we want to make sure that we're installing no less than R10 on the outside to ensure that we don't have large fluctuations in temperature, and that's about two inches of rigid insulation, two and a half inches if you're using EPS foam or rock wool, and that will provide a sufficient thermal break between the outdoor environment and the interior condition space. Now obviously if you want to bump up the R values of that continuous exterior rigid insulation, absolutely go for it, but for mass walls, the current energy codes allow for as little as R4 to be installed in zones 1 and 2 as exterior continuous insulation, and we find that's really not enough in most cases for thermal comfort, and that having R10 on the outside works for all of these warm climate zones. Again, this is only about 2 inches of rigid rigid insulation, so it's not very much. Something to keep in mind is that rigid foams are a lot more prone to deterioration from bugs, as ants and termites like to burrow into wet foam, and therefore it may be beneficial to use mineral wool instead of rigid foam if you're building in a region where these pests are common. Now, this rigid insulation is fastened to the CMU wall with masonry screws with plastic insulation washers. One brand that we commonly specify is the Windlock Wind Devil line of products. Not sponsored by them, but they have a lot of different solutions that we like. Then we have our cladding, and we can either opt for a traditional siding, which can be installed over furring strips, or we can bump up the durability even more and specify a traditional brick veneer. The other option that we have is to insulate from the interior side, and that's probably going to be the more common option that most people choose. We'll start from the outside first. We have our CMU walls, and we're still coating the exterior face in a fluid applied water and air control layer. Remember that the CMUs are porous and will readily absorb and store water. 
Then you want to determine what type of cladding you'll be finishing the walls with. Ultimately this will determine what the rest of the buildup looks like, but if you're planning to install siding or paneling of any type, you can simply install those over some furring strips, hat channels, or rain screen battens, which would be screwed into the CMUs. On the other hand, if you were planning to install stucco or a thin stone veneer or thin brick, then best practice would be to install a drainage mat between the coated CMUs and the exterior finish. You don't need a large drainage gap, but you do want to prevent the buildup of hydrostatic pressure and the potential deterioration of the exterior finishes. The easier it is for these walls to be able to dry out, the longer they're going to last. We have several options for insulation. We can insulate using rigid foam insulation. Again, you only need about 2 inches of continuous rigid insulation, except in zone 3 in which you'll need the equivalent of R13 on the interior. That's about 3 to 3.5 three inches of rigid insulation or 3.5 inches of bat insulation. Or you can combine the two and do 1 inch of rigid foam insulation and make up the rest in bat insulation. It all works. Something to keep in mind is that if you're planning to use bat insulation or fibrous insulation in isolation on the interior, so no rigid foam, you may want to coat the interior face of the CMUs with that same spray applied waterproofing. The reason being is that there could be a lot of excess construction moisture that will be drying out of the walls to the interior, and if that's the case it can increase relative humidity which can warp your interior finishes or even cause some mold to grow on the back side of the sheathing. So if you're planning on insulating and installing sheetrock quickly after framing, consider applying this to the back side of the block walls. Now just like our other wall assemblies, we want to make sure that our framed wall cavities are able to dry out unrestricted back to the interior, and therefore we don't want to install any interior vapor retarders over the face of the studs, as this will trap moisture within the cavity. It's fine if we have rigid foam directly against our CMU walls, and then we have our framed walls inboard of that, but we don't want any plastic faced or foil faced bat insulation in these assemblies, or interior vapor barriers on those studs. Now we have one final variation on this which works best in warm dry climates and that's a CMU wall with direct applied stucco on the exterior. This is a very common wall condition and actually mimics traditions from old mass masonry walls in which stucco would be used to limit rainwater penetration and more evenly distribute moisture. On our CMU walls, we have a reinforced stucco that's been applied which provides a smooth and uniform surface over the blocks covering up the mortar joints. And then over that we have a vapor permeable exterior grade water repellent paint. This is applied to the stucco to reduce the amount of water absorbed into the block wall. Even dry climates have rainy seasons, and it's important that we're not unnecessarily challenging the block wall. It is critical that the paint is highly vapor permeable, as the stucco is expected to get wet, and that moisture needs to be able to dry out through the paint. If the paint isn't permeable enough, it blisters and peels, which not only looks terrible, but it compromises the integrity of the wall. Generally, we like to specify mineral silicate paints for these types of applications, as they tend to be highly vapor open, and they chemically bond to cementitious substrates instead of forming a film, meaning that they remain a lot more durable, and you don't need to reapply them nearly as often. Then, on the interior side of the block wall, we apply a fluid applied water and air control layer as a negative side waterproofing and air barrier. This is sort of the last line of defense in the event that water starts wicking through the mortar joints in the block wall at some locations. We're not relying solely on this layer, but it's better than not having it in place. Then we're free to insulate in whatever way that we want, either with rigid foam insulation, mineral wool, fiberglass, it's up to you. Just don't install any vapor retarders on the interior face of the studs. That about sums up our standard wall assemblies for warm climates. Obviously there are countless different assemblies out there that can be made to work. These just happen to be the most common techniques and materials. All we're doing here is just rearranging them in a way that improves long term durability, moisture resistance, and building performance. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.